All right, here we are about to begin week 10 of the Vikings and tonight we're going to look at uh, Viking Iceland and medieval Iceland actually which are sort of the same thing except that <laughs> um, when we go beyond the Viking Age, when does the Viking Age end? Does anybody remember? What? 1050. No, maybe 1150. Or, well, 1050, wait a minute. Let's say the Viking Age would end maybe 1050, 1100. Maybe 1050 or 1100. Yeah, that's close enough. And Iceland lasted a lot longer than 1100, so in a way it's medieval Iceland, but they sort of blend into each other. But Iceland is really interesting. Um, I'm going to talk about medieval Iceland tonight, or Viking Iceland, or wh whichever one it is, and I'm drawing on a number of different sources. Um, uh, Gwyn Jones, who I recommend very highly for a, a very quick sketch of uh, uh, what's going on in the Viking world, although it's, he's a, got a rather thick textbook, but um, uh, you can get a lot of information out of here. And uh, there are a couple, there are several books about Viking Iceland. Uh, one that I don't have is by William E. Miller. Um, who focuses on Viking law. He is, he is a lawyer. He, he actually used to teach here at the University of Houston in the law school, and, uh, but the allergies killed him. He couldn't stand Houston, so he went to Michigan, and that's where he's teaching now. Uh, so he has written a book on Viking law in Iceland, if you're especially interested in Viking law. Here is a book by uh, an anthropologist, uh, Culture and History in Medieval Iceland, an Anthropological Analysis of Structure and Change, and uh, which sounds very anthropological by Kirsten Hallstrup. Uh, my friends in Denmark didn't care for this book. They, they felt it wasn't right on the mark. Uh, they don't like Gwyn Jones either, and they don't like Jesse Byock either, whose other books I'm going to show you. <laughs> Uh, Jesse Byock's, Byock is at UCLA. He's a good friend of mine, and he has written a number of books on medieval Iceland. This was his first book, Medieval Iceland, Society, Sagas, and Power. And one of the big breakthroughs that Jesse Byock made in this book was to rescue the sagas from oblivion because people like my friends the Danes, who are very good friends too, but they regard the sagas as untrustworthy. And so they feel that um, you really have to look at the historical sources and at the runes and at documents and law codes. And they would sort of agree with William E. Miller. Uh, that approach, the documentary approach, uh, non-sagas. Uh, Jesse Byock is, is then opposed to the theories of William E. Miller because he resuscitated the sagas as a historical source. And in this book, Medieval Iceland, he made a strong argument that the sagas are little thumbnail sketches of the, the social life, the everyday life of the farmers who lived in medieval Iceland. And that you could really get a, a peasant's eye view of the society by looking at the sagas if you're very careful and you use them quite judiciously. And so um, the thesis of this book, Society, Sagas, and Power, is that um, uh, the sagas paint a portrait of a society governed by laws and not men, that, that he has argued that there is a real democracy in Iceland. It's a little more, his argument is a little more complex than that, and, and of course, you know, he's taken a whole book to do it. This is a much older book, of course, and here is a brand new one that Jesse Bach has written that is just now out, uh, Viking Age Iceland. And um, he picks up a lot of the themes that he used in medieval Iceland, but he expands them quite a bit more. And so this is quite a lovely new book. It's a penguin book and so easy to get. get. And, and it's a really nice book. I have to say, I, I have to agree with Jesse. He makes a good case that the sagas are, are um, reasonable sources for uh, looking at the social life of Iceland and how the people function on a day-to-day -day level. They're thumbnail sketches of families and, and men uh, manipulating for power and struggling in the thing and taking their, their law cases to court and, and um, 
uh, I, I think he makes a very good case for that. And so uh, I'm going to pretty much follow uh, a combination of Gwyn Jones, really, and Jesse Bach here as we, get, as we go through. The other book I'm going to draw on tonight is the sagas of the Icelanders. And not all the sagas are in here, actually. I was looking for a couple of them and that weren't in here. But the sagas of the Icelanders, again, this is a new book by Penguin that it has a, it's, it's about a thousand pages long and it has not all the sagas but quite a number of the Icelandic sagas and so uh, I'm, I'm going to um, uh, maybe read you one of them. Uh, maybe I'll just start by reading you one saga that is very very short and it'll, it'll give you a little flavor for Icelandic society and then we'll start looking at, at the details of Icelandic society. So maybe we need a picture on here. Here is our map of the Atlantic world so that we can see where Iceland is. Um, hmm. Oh, okay, I'll read it to you in a minute. Wait, I want to get to a certain point. Let's look at our map. And here we see where Iceland is. Uh, if we look at Scandinavia, here is, of course, Norway and Denmark, and here, uh, Norway and Sweden, and here is Denmark and um, uh, Frisia over here, England here. Last week we did the Orkneys and Scotland and Ireland over here. And we can see that Iceland is just, you know, just a little skip across the ocean. And of course those Vikings with their ships, they could go anywhere. And it didn't take them long to find Iceland. In fact, you we're kind of surprised that it took them as long as they did. Uh, it's in the 900s that they actually discover Iceland and start settling there. And, um, and they sailed. They actually used these islands. They used the Orkneys, the Faroes, the Shetland, the Orkneys, the Shetlands, and the Faroes in that order as stepping stones to get to Iceland. And so here's Iceland, a little island continent out in the middle of the Atlantic. Um, and I want to raise a couple of questions about Iceland before we start. I, I, I am going to read you that very short saga in a moment. But um, one of the arguments, and really the argument that Jesse Bayak makes, is that Iceland is a frontier society, that it's colonized by the Scandinavians, specifically the Norwegians, but a lot of the British uh, people from the British Isles, uh, including Ireland and England, and the Norwegians, and that it's a frontier society, and it is the frontier experience that shapes Icelandic society. Uh, and that is one of the theses that he argues. I sort of disagree with what he says. And I had proposed, in my mind, or, or, or to my mind, Iceland is kind of what Scandinavia would have been if Europe hadn't intruded its influence into Scandinavia. That it's the kind of, you know, pure and pristine Viking society, what Viking society would have been if it hadn't been Christianized, if it hadn't been Europeanized, as it, as it certainly was by the end of our era. It's very Europeanized, and it's, it's sort of almost not Viking anymore. Of course, it's not Viking anymore. Um, the Viking Age ends, and they quit going a Viking. Ice, the Icelanders quit going a Viking, too. But when they stay in Iceland, they do something really, really different than what they do in Norway and Sweden and Denmark. And so I, I want you to keep the, the, those ideas in your mind as we go through and we look at what Iceland is all about. And then we'll, we'll sort of test it and see if, if that were, which theory makes the most sense to you. And we'll probably maybe look at it at the very end of the evening. OK, the discovery of Iceland was really made uh, quite early. And as early as 825, uh, Dicule, a, an Irish monk, wrote a Liber de Mensura Orbis Terrae, a, a book about measuring the orb, the orb of the Earth. And so that's what uh, he is writing about on the islands surrounding Britain. Let me see which book I put this in. OK. And so this is what Dicule said. There are many other islands in the ocean to the north of Britain, which can be reached from the northernmost British Isles in two days. 
and nights direct sailing with full sails and an undropping fair wind. A certain holy man informed me that in two summer's days and nights and the night between, sailing in a little boat of two thwarts, he came to land on one of them. Some of the islands are very small. Nearly all of them are separated one from the other by narrow sounds. On these islands, hermits who have sailed from our Ireland have lived for roughly a hundred years, but even as they have been constantly uninhabited since the world's beginning, so now, because of Norse pirates, they are empty of anchorites or hermits, uh, but full of innumerable sheep and a great many different kinds of sea fowl. I have never found these islands mentioned in the books of scholars. Okay, there is general agreement that Dicul is here speaking of the pharaohs uh, or the sheep islands. Pharaohs means sheep islands. In the same context, he mentions Iceland. So he knows about all these lands as early as 825. So here's how he continues the story of Iceland. It is now 30 years since priests who lived in that island, uh, uh, that is uh, Thule or the Shetlands, from the first day of February to the first day of August told me that not only at the summer solstice, no, that's not the Shetlands, that's Iceland, I'm sorry. They lived on that island, Thule, from the first day of February to the first day of August, told me that not only at the summer solstice, but in the days on either side of it, the setting sun hides itself at the evening hour as if behind a little hill, so that no darkness occurs that very brief period of time, but whatever task a man wishes to perform, even to picking the lice out of his shirt, he can manage it precisely as in broad daylight. And had they been on a high mountain, the sun would at no time have been hidden from them. So he's uh, describing the midnight sun in summertime on Iceland. And now, Dicuil continues, They deal in fallacies who have written that the sea round the island is frozen and that there is a continuous day without night from the vernal to the autumnal equinox and vice versa, perpetual night from the autumnal equinox to the vernal. For those sailing at an expected time of great cold have made their way thereto and dwelling on the island enjoyed always alternate night and day save at the time of the, of the solstice. But after one day sailing from there to the north, they found the frozen sea. Okay, the frozen sea is there, but it's to the north of Iceland in the Arctic Ocean. So 825, Dicul, an Irish monk, knew all about Iceland and knew it was there. And he describes Irish priests going to Iceland and living there as hermits. Irish priests had reached the pharaohs soon after the year 700 and 100 years later Norsemen arrived. Uh, the first of these was Grim Camben who came by way of Ireland or the Hebrides and he may have been a Christian. But after his death the fellow settlers from Norway worshipped him and offered him sacrifices. So, so much for Christianity on the Faroe Islands. The economy of the islands was based on sheep and fowling and fishing and whaling. But intelligence gleaned in Ireland, the Western Isles, Orkney and Shetland led the Norsemen to the Pharaohs. So they knew the Pharaohs were there. And here we'll get a little bit closer with our map. So here are the Norsemen who go to Ireland and they learn about, uh, they learn from the, the priests that Iceland is out there and they learn that uh, the, the Shetlands and the Faroes are out there. They also learn in the Orkneys. All these islands are very close and you can see what stepping stones they would make across the sea. So it's pretty easy to figure out that it's there. And you know, there, um, uh, have any of you ever heard the uh, legend of St. Brendan? There, there is actually a story about St. Brendan. It, it's a little treatise written down in the 10th century, 12th century, although it may be older than that. But St. Brendan is supposed to have sailed across the Atlantic out into the wild ocean. And the way it's described as you read it, um, it almost sounds like descriptions of the islands going across to America. I mean, it really does sound that. And there have been historic, there are legends about Welshmen and Ireland, Irishmen going to America, but they're usually thought of as, as legends. Anyway, there is that saga 
uh, it's, it's like a saga, St. Brendan the Navigator. Um, so these Irish monks are going to Ireland and that's how the Norsemen hear about it and so uh, they, they set out for it. Irish priests reached Iceland in the 790s and news must have spread rapidly. For men in the Faroes, Iceland was close by. But surprisingly, the first voyages to Iceland were delayed until around 860. And three names are associated with the first recorded voyages. Um, interestingly, in the Island Islandingabok, uh, 1125, Ari Thorgelson, the author of that book, mentions none of them. The Islandinga book is the book of settlement for the Icelanders and, and it tells about all the settlements. It doesn't tell about any of the discoverers of Iceland. The first of these discoverers is Gardar uh, Svavarsson, uh, the Swede. At the behest of his mother, a seerist, or to lay claim to his wife's inheritance from her father in the Hebrides, Garter set sail from Scandinavia, was driven off course, and through a gale and good luck, raised Iceland. Uh, and he saw Iceland just east of the Eastern Horn. And um, I'm going to show you a series of maps of Iceland. Here is Iceland all by itself. This is plain so that we can see um, the areas, the various areas of Iceland. This is north. I should put that on this map. This is north, south, west, and east. Okay, so the east fjords are here. Here is the eastern uh, horn where um, uh, Gardar uh, gets, reaches Iceland, and here's the western horn down here. Here are the west fjords up here. So we can get oriented to Iceland as an island, as an island and see what it is. Okay, Gardar then sailed around the land, and he wintered at Husavik in Skjalfandi, the Trembler, and the following island, uh, the following summer, he learned that it was an island, and he modestly named it Gardar's home after himself. Okay, Gardar's home. Uh, now, so I'm going to skip back to the map, and then I'm going to come through. Okay, here is Gardar, and Gardar is the green line. Can we see the green line here? It looks, um, I'm afraid, I'm not sure it, it comes across as green on your screen, but I'll, I'll trace it here. It's this upper line. Gardar comes along here. He comes actually to the eastern horn, then the western horn. He sails all around Iceland, and then he spends, interestingly, the winter here. Yeah, where that's not a very good place to spend the winter in the far north, but that's where he spends the winter and then he keeps sailing and when he gets here, he realizes it's an island and he's gone all the way around it and then he heads for home. So then he modestly names it Gardar's home. Okay, now the second discoverer is Nadod the Viking and he is Norwegian. Uh, and I think Gardar was Swedish, wasn't he? Let's see. Okay. Yes, Gardar Svavarsson was a Swede. All right. And so Nadod is Norwegian. Um, according to uh, Sturla Thordarsson's Landnama book, the Book of Settlements, uh, Nadod is given the credit for actually discovering Iceland. Nadod was Vikinger Mikil, an exile for murder. That means that he was sent into exile because he had committed a murder and he was an outlaw and so when he was sent away. Norway and the Norse settlements were too hot to hold him, so storm-tossed he discovered Iceland by accident. He landed in Radarfjord in the East Firth, and he climbed Radarfjall in hope of seeing smoke or other form of human habitation. So let's now look at our map, and we see Nadod coming in here on this red line, and he goes in here, 
and he actually goes in here where he climbs a mountain. He looks around and he sees no sign of human habitation and then he goes home. Okay. As he and his crew sailed away, a heavy snowstorm enveloped the mountain and he, so he named the land Snayland or Snowland. And back home in the Pharaohs, he praised it highly. Okay, so now two people knew, and their crews, of course, knew that uh, something was out there, an island was out there. Well, the third discoverer was Floki Vilgerdassen from Rogaland, uh, who was Norwegian. And he was also Vikinger McKill. Uh, he was an outlaw because he had committed murder, so he, would, he had to leave the land or he would be killed. He, he sailed for Garter's home Snayland because he had heard it was out there as though intending to settle there. And he took with him livestock and offered up sacrifices. In fact, he hallowed three ravens to show him the way. And here we get to learn a little bit about Viking navigation. He began by sailing to the Shetlands, and there he lost one of his daughters by drowning. Okay, now we get a little bit of information. He took his daughters with him, so there were women with him on the voyage. Then he sailed to the Faroe Islands, and he lost another daughter to marriage. Then he sailed to Iceland with the three ravens. Okay. When he got a little ways out, he loosed the first raven, which flew back to the land it had left, to the Faroe Islands. So he knew that he hadn't gone far enough yet. He went a little ways further. He loosed the second raven, which rose, looked around, sort of flew around the ship and returned to the ship. There was no land nearby. Then he went a little farther and loosed the third, which flew straight ahead, and this gave him a bearing for Iceland. They raised the horn from the east and sailed along the south coast to the northern shore of Bredafjord to Vatnasfjord on Bardar Strand. And here they spent their time fishing and sealing with no thought of winter. And you know why they probably did that. And, and, and you know, I was thinking, how could they do that? How could they possibly just just fish and seal without even thinking about winter coming? They're Scandinavians. They would prepare for winter. But the Gulf Stream goes around Iceland and especially around the western coast so that the waters are very warm. And so they must have thought that it was just going to be warm through the winter because they, they didn't take any time preparing. And, that, and of course, the abundance of fish around the uh, island was amazing and seals and animals and no thoughts of winter and also there are no predators at all on Iceland no predatory animals and so they could walk up to all the animals and birds and just pick them up they had no fear of human beings because the only humans they had seen were the Irish priests who really left them alone and so they must have thought they'd come to a paradise of game and fish and birds uh, who would just let them pick them up. Well, winter came, and it was cold and snowy, and immediately their livestock, their sheep and their cattle, died because they hadn't raised any hay to feed them through the winter. And spring was very cold, and there they were up in the north. So Floki climbed a mountain, and here we're going to look at where he is. Here is a Floki who comes along to the western fjord, uh, basically the same way that Gardar did. Here's Floki coming to the western fjord, and going up around here, we've got two lines for Floki. He goes around here, and he goes up here to Breda Fjord here at the west, and he he spends the winter at Vatnas Fjord over here, and and um, this is a strand or a beach. Okay, so this is where he spends the winter in that western area. And uh, then uh, we'll see what happens to him next, and we'll go to another map. Here is an interesting uh, sort of map of Breda Fjord, and you can see going into that fjord, um, look at the landscape here. Uh, Jesse Bayek says that Iceland isn't anything like Norway and Sweden, but look at these fjords, and it's very mountainous, um, but it isn't like, it isn't like 
Norway and Sweden because it's not very forested. There's not very much wood in Iceland, and there and there are certain things that are far different in Iceland uh, from um, Norway and Sweden. The fjords and the cold and the snow are like Sweden. Well, he saw the southern arms of Arnarfjord stiff with ice, and so he gave the island the name of I Iceland, island or Iceland, and later. Hoisting sail for his return, he failed to clear the Reykjanes headland. Uh, running before storms, he spent the winter in Borgarfjord, and his crewman, Heriolf, crossed Faxafloy in a towboat and even survived. But on return to Norway, after the horrible experience of two winters when he couldn't get out of Iceland and he nearly froze to death and he lost all the animals and the men were starving, Foki had nothing good to say about Iceland. But Heriolf, his crewman Heriolf, spoke well of some things and ill of others. And another crewman, Thorolf, reported that butter dripped from every blade of grass. And so after that, he was nicknamed Thorolf Butter um, in the Viking way. Okay, so here he spends the winter here in Vatnasfjord, and then he sails back and um, sails back around here. And here is the cape he could not get around, so he had to spend another winter because the storms isolated him there. And so then he had to return home this way, having, having had a terrible experience in Iceland. But now everybody knew Iceland was there. So settlement begins in the 870s and the 880s. And the founding father was Ingolf Arnarson. The Icelandinga Boka was uh, the book that, that um, really recorded all the families uh, that settled in Iceland. Uh, it reports that a Norwegian named Ingolf is the man of whom it is reliably reported that he was the first to leave uh, there for Iceland, leave Norway for Iceland, when Harold Fairhair was 16 years old, and a second time a few years later. Finally, he settled south in Reykjavik, east of Minthjaksir, where he made his first landing, and Ingolfsfell, west of, Ulfus, of the Ulfus River, where he afterwards took land into his possession. At that time, Iceland was covered with forests between the mountain and the seashore, but not in the mountains. There are, there are heavily glaciated areas of Iceland. It has an interesting uh, kind of topography. So here he goes. He sails around here, and he settles in Reykjavik, which is right here. Can you see Reykjavik here? And notice these little pink pyramidal structures, those are active volcanoes that are in Iceland. And one of the neat things about Iceland is you can go to the volcanoes and there are hot springs all around them. And so they can sort of revel in the hot springs, which make it really different from Norway and Sweden. Okay, but interestingly, he sails all around here. And, and why does he settle in the west coast? It's because the Gulf Stream, remember, is along this west coast, which makes it warmer. And so this is um, uh, Ingolf's um, first winter is here, and his second winter is, is here. No, his, his second winter is here. His first winter is here, his second winter is here, his third winter is here, and finally he settles in Reykjavik, okay, around um, 873. Okay, so this is the first settlement in Iceland right there. And here is Breda Fjord. Here is another map that shows the, the close-up of the land. And this is Helgafell. We're going to look at Helgafell in a minute, this, this big mountain that becomes a religious shrine in this area. This is Breda Fjord in the northwest, just north of Reykjavik. And this is the lay of the land. Can't you see why Vikings would love it? I mean, all these islands and these fjords and then mountains here. And then at the time they settled, it was forested all the way to the sea here. Okay, and here is a color 
photograph of Iceland at sunset. Uh, the land it now is quite barren because in the first hundred years the Vikings deforested it. Uh, there wasn't enough timber there or forest to sustain uh, the amount that they needed and so they cut it all down and it was gone. I mean they really changed the lay of the land in Iceland. So here we can see a little bit of what the land might look like in this color picture of uh, this is water in here and this is going into a fjord. It's a little bit hard to see and then here are these arms of land that come out that would have been very appealing to the Vikings. Here are some more pictures of what the land would look like. This is Gulf, Gulf Foss, which would be a big foss in the land and a rushing river. Lots of rivers everywhere in Iceland. It's filled with rivers and it's very rich in rivers and of course the fish and the wild animals that live in it. Um, here is another view of Iceland so that you can see the, um, the lay of the land. And again, these drawings were made after it was deforested. You can see the river flowing through here and the valleys, which are ideal for grazing their sheep and their cattle, by the way, because there are no wolves, no carnivorous animals, no enemies for the sheep. They didn't have to build any fences and they didn't have to watch them so that, or protect them from animals. It's very craggy, craggy mountains coming down to the sea, as you can see along here in this one on the north coast of Cape Horn. And here's a little Viking ship sailing along the coast. And here is Midfjord and Hrutafjord again in the north, kind of rocky land coming down to the sea. And the sea is everywhere, uh, although there are some settlements inland, but most of them are on the sea. Uh, and here we can see Drangi and the shore of Fljot, and we can see the sea along here and these craggy mountains coming down to the shore. Okay, the Landnama book enlarges the story. Towards 870, two foster brothers back in Norway, Ingolf Arnorsson or Bjornolfsson, he's known as both, and his foster brother Leif Hrodmarsson were to fall out with their former allies and friends, the three sons of Jarl Atli the Slender of Galar. One of these brothers at a winter feast rashly swore to marry Helga, Ingolf's sister the betrothed of Leif Hrodmarsson. Okay, so we've got um, uh, Ingolf's sister is Helga, and she is betrothed to Leif Hrodmarsson, and one of the three sons of Jarl Atli the Slender then took a shine to marry Helga, but she was already betrothed. This vow that he made cost him his life next, next spring when Leif and, and Ingolf then killed him. And within a year, his brother f soon followed him violently into the grave. Well, at this point, the foster brothers, Ingolf and Leif, were now compelled to forfeit their estates. They were tried for murder and they were made outlaws. And so, once again, we have outlaws going to Iceland. The foster brothers, Ingolf and Leif, fitted out a big ship and went to find the land Raven Floki had discovered. Okay, and so here is our reminder of a Viking ship. This is actually an Anglo-Saxon or Norman ship. Um, and they took their women with them and, of course, their livestock. And here is a, here is a woman on this ship. You can see it's very Viking. Um, Ingolf and Leif made a reconnaissance in Alptage Fjord area of Osfather and wintered in Iceland. They returned home, however, to Norway to plan a permanent settlement. And three or four years later, they came back to Iceland with two ships and with their families, their retainers, and also Irish slaves. And on sighting the Icelandic coast, Ingolf cast his high seat pillars overboard. He vowed to settle wherever Thor brought them ashore, and they went ashore on Ingolfshafti on the south coast. But Hjörleif was carried 60 miles further west to Hjörleifshafti. There, 
they were tricked and killed by their Irish slaves. This is Horleaf's company. They were tricked and killed by their Irish slaves who then made off with the women, the goods, and the ship's boats. Okay, and so here we see, I'm sorry, I told you wrong the other way. Here are Ingolf's uh, travels. Here is Ingolf's first winner. Here is Ingolf's second winner and Ingolf's third winner. And Hjorleif is actually killed right here. And the slaves take uh, everybody off to some islands around, uh, over in here somewhere that are then named the Westman Islands because um, the slaves were there. Ingolf caught up, up with these Irish slaves at the Fangi Islands. It's the Fangi Islands that we're talking about to the southwest and killed them all to a man. And that is how the islands got their name, Vesmaniar, the Isles of the Men from the West or the Irishmen. Ingolf's thralls then found his high seat pillars at Reykjavik, and Ingolf built a house there the following spring. There, from this base, he distributed lands to his followers and established a pattern of land taking and local lordship that was to be continued thereafter by the settlers in the island. The colonization from this point proceeded with vigor, and the Norsemen found a few papar or Irish monks, but otherwise the land was empty. And so let me read you a description of Iceland um, and we'll look at the island while I read it. Okay. All I have to do is find it. <laughs> All right, here's the description of Iceland. There was no one and nothing to subdue except the land itself, some five-sixths of which offered no support to human life. There were large areas devastated by volcanic action with their debris of craters, lava fields, ash, and coarse black sand. There were screes, moraines, and rocky outcrops, swamps and quags, geysers, and boiling mud. There were mountains, often barren, and ice fields, always deathly. Fierce rivers poured from the island center to the sea, untamable as Thiorsa, or for long distances unfordable and unbridgeable as the northern and eastern Jokulsa. It was a sundered and barricaded land to which the land takers came. Fire rose out of the ground, and sometimes the earth shook as though to rid itself of human encumbrance. But this was by no means all the story. The habitable parts of the country proved attractive to men seeking sometimes a home, sometimes a refuge. Grass grew plentifully in long valleys on broad plains or hillsides fronting the sea, and upland grazing on the Hythe offered sheep a good living during the light, bright months of summer. There was birch wood and scrub between mountain and seashore, and carpets of succulent blueberries in season, while the first generation, helped by a less extreme climate, grew a modest supply of grain. The lakes and rivers were filled with trout and salmon, the surrounding seas with fish and seals and whales, and the coasts and islands bred innumerable sea fowl. And everywhere these creatures were at ease in the hunting grounds because men and men's ways were unknown to them. There were many catchment areas for driftwood, but by about 930, all the suitable land had been occupied. Uh, and so it didn't take very long because Iceland could not support a very large population because that so much of it, five-sixths of the land was uninhabitable. And so they, they only had actually a sixth of a land that they could use. The majority of settlers came from southwest Norway, either directly or by way of Scotland, the Faroes, and Ireland. From southwest Norway also came Iceland's law and language and religion and the Norse civilization. Some of the settlers were Christian, like Odd the Deep-Minded, who set up Christian crosses at Crosshalar near Hvam in Hvamsford, um, and in Svartkel from, uh, Svartkel from Caithness, the grandson of Glum, prayed to a cross. 
and this is the prayer he prayed, um, a blessing on the old ones, a blessing on the young. Helgi the lean believed in Christ, yet made vows to Thor for sea voyages just in case, just to make sure, and also for anything of any real importance. But the vast majority of the settlers were heathen, and some fiercely so. Thorolf Mostrar Skeg made of Helgafell a holy mountain uh, that was a, clearly a, a, um, a refuge for the uh, um, the pagan cults. And so the, most of the settlers came from Norway, although some came from the Faroes, but most of them came from Norway to Iceland. Um, on the farther shore of Breda Fjord, uh, there he made an inviolate sanctuary in Helgafell, and no man nor beast could suffer harm there. It was a kind of place of sanctuary. The Landnamabok records the names of some 400 settlement men, and roughly one-seventh of them were Celtic. That means they came from Ireland or Scotland or the Western Isles of Scotland. There were also many Celtic slaves and concubines, but some of good Irish birth. Uh, the effect of this admixture of blood and manners, uh, Norse and Irish, is much debated by historians, ethnologists, and literary critics. Did the Irish infusion distinguish the Icelanders from the other Norse? Did the Irish change them at all? Well, that's something we have to decide by looking at their culture and seeing how different they are from the Norse and what made them different. But Iceland was fully occupied by 930, according to Ari Thorgelson, and Viking armies at that time were suffering reverses in Brittany and England and Dublin, and in Anglesey and the Hebrides, Scotland and the Orkneys. Freedom of movement and prospects of gain were sharply curtailed, and so at this very moment it was a good time to settle in Iceland to stop Viking because they were being the Vikings were being beaten off by the by the defenders everywhere around Europe. Also, at that very time, King Harold Fairhair, who, who you remember from Ale Saga, was welding the Norse kingdom together. And the Viking traditions insist that Iceland was settled because of the tyranny of King Harold. And remember from Ale Saga how it was Skallagrim who went to Iceland, wasn't it, who settled there because he wanted to escape from the tyranny of King Harold. So that is kind of preserved in the sagas. But probably also there may have been land shortages growing in Scandinavia, the pressure of population. Surely it must have also been the restless and the ambition or emulation, the prospect of trade and possible easy pickings. Although, although clearly Iceland was not a place you could trade. There was nobody there to trade with. It was a place that you would go to if you wanted to settle, and everybody knew what was there. It was not a place to trade. King Harold Fairhair, however, took an interest in the colonization, and in fact he wished to exert control over it and suzerainty or control over the colonists. And so one of the ways he did this was to levy a tax on the Norse emigrants to Iceland. And if you wanted to go to Iceland, you would have to pay a tax to King Harold. He also pronounced that no one should occupy more land than he and his crew could carry fire around in one day. Well, there's one story that Uni the Dane, son of Gardar, went to Iceland at the beginning of King Harold, and in fact he was intending to make himself king of Iceland. Uh, it didn't work, but there is that thought that he wanted to be king. So here we have the people fleeing Norway. They're also extending the settlement of Norway up to the north at that time because they're fleeing the the political uh, cohesiveness uh, that the kings are, are instituting here in Norway and Sweden and Denmark as they're building kingdoms and so settlers are fleeing to Iceland or to the extreme north. So he wanted to make himself king of Iceland and the kings of Norway continued to keep a half paternal, half covetous or greedy eye on Iceland until it was subjected to King Hakon Hakon Arson in 1262 to 4. So uh, 
the kings of Norway always had their eyes peeled for Iceland. They wanted it. And it took them about 300 years, actually, to, to take it over. And we'll see why that happens later on. We can rely on the general picture of settlers in the Icelandic sources, and they're described as resourceful men crossing the northern seas in tough and buoyant ships, making landfalls, getting ashore, exploring the empty countryside, and exploiting its resources. Uh, they appropriated land by strength and first comers' rights, and they granted homes and holdings to their faithful followers. So what do we have here? We have people kind of like Jarls, like Skallagrim, who are coming with retainers or herdsmen, and the leader who owns the ship is might be a Jarl or a chieftain who then gets the first pick, uh, he gets the land and then he hands it out. He parcels it out to the different herdsmen who are his followers. Then they all settle down and the Jarl calls no man master nor many a peer. And so they're, they're almost making little independent settlements in every part of Iceland. And so here we have a ship. This is, of course, a Norman ship that reminds us of how the settlers might come. There are horses on this ship, but the Vikings didn't take horses. They would have taken sheep and cattle on their ships. They built temples for the worship, usually of Thor, sometimes of Frey more rarely of Njord, Balder, and Tur. Odin's followers were few, but the next generation would include Ale from our famous Ale Saga. And one example is Mostrarskeg's temple at Hofstadir in Bredafjord. And here is the description of that temple that he built. He had a temple built, and a mighty edifice it was. There was a doorway in the side wall nearer to one end, and inside stood the pillars of the high seat, with nails in them which were called the God's Nails. The area inside was a great sanctuary. Further in was a room of the same shape and order as the choir in churches today, where in the middle of the floor, like an altar, stood a pedestal with an arm ring without a join lying on it, twenty ounces in weight, on which men must swear all their oaths. The temple priest was required to wear this ring on his arm at all public assemblies. On the pedestal, too, must stand the sacrificial bowl, and in it a sacrificial twig, like an aspergillum, by means of which blood, which was called blout, shall be sprinkled from the bowl. The blood, that is, which was shed when animals were slaughtered as a sacrifice to the gods. Around the pedestal in this same room were set the images of the gods. So we have a, a pretty clear description of a temple that was built, which, which wouldn't be standing there now still. This account may well be fictional because there are no archaeological remains, uh, and archaeology has tended to nullify uh, some of the saga evidence uh, describing buildings of this sort. The privilege and perquisite of a man of means and authority was to maintain part of one's house for occasional religious use, to provide oxen and horses for the sacrifice. And let's look at Iceland, and I'm going to read you this little story and see what you think about this. It's very short. This is the tale of the story-wise Icelander. It so happened one summer that a bright young Icelandic man came to the king and asked to be taken into his care. The king asked if he knew any lore, and he claimed that he could tell stories. The king then said that he would keep him, but he would be obligated always to entertain anyone who asked him. He did so and grew popular among the king's men. They gave him clothes, and the king gave him weapons, and so it went until Yule. Then the Icelander grew sad. The king asked why, and he answered that he was just in a bad mood. That can't be it, the king said, so let me guess. I would guess that you have run out of stories to tell. This winter you have always entertained anyone who has asked you. Now you are upset that you're out of stories at Yule. It's just as you say, he replied. I have only one story left, and that one I dare not tell here, for it is the story of your travels. 
The king said, and that is exactly the story I most desire to hear. Now don't tell any stories until Yule, since people are busy now. But on the first day of Yule, begin the story and tell a little bit of it. I will arrange it with you so that the story lasts as long as Yule. Now a lot of drinking takes place at Yuletide, and there is little time for sitting around and hearing stories. Nor will you be able to see while you are telling whether I am pleased or not. So it happened, and the Icelander told his story. He began on the first day of Yule and spoke for a while, but the king soon told him to stop. Then people started drinking, and many of them discussed how bold it was of the Icelander to tell that story, or how they thought the king would like it. Some thought that he told the story well, but some were less patient, and so it went on during Yule. The king made sure that people listened carefully, and under his direction the story and Yule ended at the same time. On Twelfth Night, after the story had ended earlier in the day, the king said, Aren't you curious, Icelander, to know how I like the story? I am afraid to know, my lord, he answered. The king said, I liked it very much, and it was no worse than the matter permitted. But who taught you the story? He answered, It was my habit out in my country to travel each summer to the thing, and I learned part of the story each summer from Haldor Snorrison. In that case, it is no wonder, the king said, that you know it well. Your luck will now be with you. Be welcome here with me, and I will grant you whatever you want. The king secured him good wares, and he grew into vigorous manhood. So this is a little short story of the sagas. And, and we learn a little bit about, not Icelandic life, but at least life at the court of the king, where they drink a lot and during Yule. They tell lots of stories, and we have him, uh, I mean, he's like a scald, and the king is keeping him there because he's a storyteller. So we have that same sort of... Uh, influence there from Iceland. We also see that the Icelanders travel, but they go back to Norway all the time. And so there are a lot of stories in here that take place at different king's courts um, that um, involve Icelanders traveling to the king's court. So they're, they're traveling, uh, not necessarily trading though. Well, the power of the chieftain, or, or the Jarl, arose out of and contributed to his strong position in the district. So the strong chieftain was the one who was in control, and, and, and he had his own men who were his dependents. The Godi is the distinctive Icelandic title of the secular priest, and the plural is Godar. Uh, so a Godi is not necessarily a Jarl. Um, but he could be a Jarl, and usually he's a chieftain, but it's a religious title. It, it's a secular priest, and so in Iceland it grows that these people are, these men are the chief men of all the provinces. Uh, so the plural is Godar. Until 930, there was no central authority in Iceland, and the Godar were its rulers. The office could be acquired, it could be shared, it could be borrowed or disposed of, but it remained a perquisite of the rich and powerful. And when we use the term rich, we're speaking in relative terms because Iceland, by and large, is extremely poor. They don't. There's not a lot of wealth there. Everything is everything is um, in the land. I mean, wealth. Land is wealth. There are no real products of Iceland that they can trade with anybody else. And so it, it's a farming community, and it's, it's, it's fairly poverty-stricken. It's not very wealthy. Um, so the Godar come to be the rulers of Iceland, and there's still, in 930, there's no central authority. Everything is very localized. It kind of replicates the conditions in Scandinavia before the Vikings went out a Viking before the strong men started building their power everywhere in Scandinavia. And in fact, Jesse Bayak calls it a retrogression. He says they regress into an older form of community that existed in Scandinavia before the Vikings went out a Viking and building cities and, and bringing wealth back, which is an interesting concept. Um, 
lesser men to the godar could transfer duty and allegiance from one godi to another. But in 930, the legislative and judicial power was placed in the hands of 36 leading godar. The chieftains were entrusted, the chieftains then entrusted the introduction of a legal code to Ophliot of Lon. Okay, Ophliot returned to Norway to his uncle Thorleif the Wise, and there in Norway they took the Gullathing law of Norway, the law of Western Norway, and they adapted it to Iceland. And to quote, and when he returned to Iceland, the all thing was established, and thereafter men had but one law here in the land. So they, they went to Norway, and Ulfliot got the Gullathing law, and he brought it back to Iceland. It became the national law code of the land. Ulfliot's law survives only in little snippets, um, and, and it's been superseded by other law codes. But here's an example of, of what might have been in Ulfliot's law. This was the beginning of the heathen laws, that men should not have a ship with a figurehead at sea, but if they had, they must remove the head before coming inside of land, and not sail to land with gaping heads and yawning jaws, so that the spirits of the land grow frightened of them. Okay, they've got the whole Norse religion with them, with all the spirits and the elves and the dwarves and the gnomes and all of the little people everywhere that they're used to in the land spirits. The 36 Godar who controlled the All Thing, which was a national assembly, then elected a kind of president, and he was he was the law speaker. Uh, the uh, Old Norse word is loso gamader, law speaker. And this meant that he would recite the law because they didn't have a written language, really. They, the runes were only used for short inscriptions, not to write text. And so the duty of the law speaker was to rule for three years, and each year he would recite one-third of the law code. And so the term of three years meant that he could recite the whole law code, and then he could be re-elected. The law speaker was the embodiment of the Constitution. He was a repository of law, but he did not rule the country or even the courts. I mean, his, it was like being a Supreme Court, uh, like a living library. And so what he did was recite the law, and that was his job. He could exert influence, but had no power at all, no political, uh, no, he had political power, but it was only influence. I mean, he, he legally, he couldn't really do anything. He couldn't rule on the law. He could only, only recite what the law was. Well, the all thing was an assembly for law of all free men who chose or were appointed to attend. And so uh, uh, what they would do was in each local district, all the dependents would sort of elect or appoint their godar, their godi, to go to the all thing. And so he would go as a kind of representative of the local area where he was the most powerful man. And he would bring with him all of his dependents who needed to go. Not all of them would need to go, but some of them would have cases that they would bring into court. First and foremost, uh, the all thing was the instrument of aristocratic rule because the Godar controlled it. It wasn't actually democratic election. But in each local district, the most powerful man would go. And he would not be elected because, remember, he would be the richest man who would then dispense his patronage to his dependents who were, who were there. Uh, within their home districts in the various parts of Iceland, the Godar authority was absolute. So the, go the Godi would rule in his local district and he would have the say of everything. So it's not exactly a democracy, although there are sort of democratic elements in it. And here is Iceland with all the different things. I wanted to show you where um, the, the all thing is. It's right here at Thingvellir. Okay, the first thing, can you see this little pink dot here? The first thing was held right here, but then soon it moved to a more auspicious and holy site, Thingvellir, 
here in the middle of the land near Reykjavik. And so we have Thingvellir being formed there. All right. This changed in the reforms of 965. And at that point, and this is only 30 years later because the law code is written in 930 and 965, Iceland was divided into four quarters. And sensibly, they named them the North, South, East, and West quarters. Easy to remember, right? And at that point, the number of Godar was raised from 36 to 39. They added three more Godi. Godi. In each quarter then, there were assemblies for the law in the spring and in the autumn, so that there were now local assemblies that took on some of the prerogatives of the all thing in each of the quarters. The spring things that met in the spring disposed of minor suits, and there were three local spring things each in the south, east, and west quarters, and four in the north. The north is larger, by the way, and more barren. Three Godar presided over each local assembly, and the all things legislative and judicial functions were separated at this time. The legislature now changed its name to the Logreta, or log writer. And you can see what that term means, log writer, uh, uh, law writer, uh, to make everything right according to the law. Now, the legislature had 142 members, and later on, two bishops were added after the conversion. The disproportion of the North Quarter was redressed by the co-option of three Godar from or three Godi Godar from each of the other quarters, and then this made 48 in all. Each Godi was attended by three advisors without power to vote. So now we have the all thing increased to 48 members, and each was a Godi who brought with him three advisors from his local area. And so it's sort of representative government, sort of. I mean, almost democracy. Okay. And here is a map that shows where the quarters are. And you can see that the northern quarter is much larger. It's also more barren and more sparsely populated eastern quarter here, the southern quarter here, and the western quarter here, and here is Thingvellir up here. Um, Breda Fjord up here is where, uh, uh, actually, the uh, in the north, the uh, or in the west, uh, we have the Thing site here that I'm actually going to show you, which is right here, Thor, Thor's Nest Thing with Helgafell. This is Helgafell in the background where that famous temple was that I read you the description of in the distance, and here is the plain where Thorness thing was with the remains, the ruins of the booze and the doom ring and Thor stone. And um, I'm, I'm not sure I can point out which is Thor's stone and the ruins of the booze unless these are the booze, or no, these must be the booze over here. And this is where a, a sort of natural amphitheater, which was usually chosen, looks like this might have been the, the Thor stone here and this natural amphitheater where they would have paid attention to the law speaker speaking up here. If you remember the description we had when we talked about the society. And here is the Thor stone at Thor's nest thing, um, which would be the holy stone where uh, the law speaker would speak or and the courts, uh, the cases would be judged. The Logretta alone could make new laws and interpret or amend old ones. The Logretta granted partner, pardons and issued permits. But the judicature was now operated from the four quarter courts. So what's happening is laws could be made or interpreted or amended only in the Logretta at the all thing, the legislature. and. The, the courts of justice were now located in the four quarter courts. And these local courts heard lawsuits from their own part of the country. 
and trial was made and judgment given in each court. And each court would have been made up of the local Godi, the, the, the local Godar, the great men of that area. A panel of judges or jurymen would, um, would make the final judgment, probably 36 in number, appointed by the Godar of the quarter. And the quarter court was expected to reach a unanimous decision, and unanimous was defined as unanimous if the minority vote did not exceed six. So um, 30 was unanimous in this uh, board of 36 uh, jurymen. In 1005, a fifth court was established, a court of appeal called the Fimtardomer, and this had 48 judges or jurymen appointed by the Godar of the country. Now the constitution of Iceland was complete, but since the Godar chose the law speaker, and they, they elected the law speaker, they also controlled the logretta, and they administered the local things and appointed the judges to the quarter courts and the fifth court. So is it a democracy? Because they completely controlled all these institutions. The Godar controlled all the institutions. Uh, the logretta, the, the election of the law speaker, the, and they, they had control of the local things and appointed the judges to the quarter courts and the fifth court. So what would you say? Is this a democracy? What do you think? I mean, they do, the Godar do elect the law speaker, and the law is the law of the land, the ruling voice of the land. I mean, they do follow the laws. Is it a democracy? What do you think? It's a, it's a very limited democracy. I mean, the... I mean, like when we started, the white <coughs> land land owning people have mm -hmm. a voice, but mm -hmm. other than that, no. You know, it does remind you of the colonies, the American colonies, <coughs> and how they were governed. Anybody else have any thoughts on whether this is a democracy or not? I mean, Jesse Byatt calls it a democracy. Gwen Jones says it is not. Which one of them is right? Do you think? <laughs> In fact. Jesse Byatt calls it the first democracy in all of Europe, the first democratic state. What do you think about that? Any opinions here? If it's not a democracy, what is it? What would you call it? Press your mic. <laughs> you have an answer? <laughs> I'm looking at it. I'm, I'm thinking more of a commonwealth. So a like commonwealth. It, yeah. Okay. Okay. How how would you define it as a commonwealth? What uh, what makes it a it, commonwealth? It, uh, I'm still thinking, but I'm I'm looking at yeah. it kind of like the House of Lords, where they're okay. all aristocratic, and then they have the uh, Commons advising them. Okay, uh, and I'm still yeah. on that train of thought, but that, it's a representative democracy at best. Okay, at best a representative democracy. You, are, but the House of Lords is a nice comparison. That's a very nice comparison. Anybody else have any thoughts on that? On the on the government of Iceland? Is it a government you might like to live under? What do you think? <laughs> they had a lot of money. You <laughs> had a lot of money. Nobody in Iceland has a lot of money. Okay, this is what's interesting. It's a very poor country. Once they chop down all the trees, they can't build any ships, right? <laughs> and so, and they don't have a, they don't have, they don't have any goods to trade. I mean, everybody in the world has sheep and cows and milk and butter, and the only thing they ever end up trading is is those um, furry coats that the women weave that are sort of you know fashionable. They become a fashion item later on. But they're not wealthy. They're very poor. I mean, land is wealth here. And as Jesse Bach says, it kind of regresses. While Norway is bounding ahead and building towns and building trade, there are no cities. I mean, Reykjavik is a kind of little settlement of houses. It's not, it, it, it's like a farm. 
it's not it's not a town. There are no towns at all in Iceland. All of the people live in isolated settlements out in the countryside. So um, everybody's poor. Um, yeah, comment. So was the attraction to go there just if you were an outlaw or just weren't a place to live? If you wanted to be a colonist and go to a new land and claim land of your own, you could do that. Um, that seems to be it. That seems to be the attraction. One, and one, of course, they claim, the, uh, the Book of Settlements claims, that they were trying to escape the tyranny of the king who was clamping down and his rule on the kingdom at that time. They wanted to maintain their independence. And don't you think with this government... That would explain why they came up with a different form of law and different form of, of society. They, didn't, they, they learned from what they didn't know at the time. It would. Oh, oh, he was pressing his mic. Yeah. You, go, you want to repeat that? Well, that would explain why they came up with a different form of society, a different way to rule it, because they didn't want a repeat of what they left. They didn't want a king. They didn't want a repeat of what they left. Yeah, maybe your mic isn't working. I wonder if it's not working. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, it, it would explain why they developed it. And remember that Ulfjot, uh went to Norway and he changed the Gullathing law. He adapted it for Iceland, so that's interesting. And they really did have a kind of representative form uh, of government. I mean, it's, it's like sort of a democracy. Also, because there was a lack of wealth, they would have to tend to work together more. <gasps> Good point. Yeah, because there was a lack of wealth, they would have to tend to work together more. They had more of an equal standing just by default. By default, they had equal standing, yeah. But, they're, they're sti but again, Jesse Bach says they regress into a two-class society, whereas, whereas there are many more layers in... in Scandinavia in the original society in Norway and, and Sweden and Denmark. There are many more layers of, of the, and slavery disappeared in no time at all. Slavery disappeared. Yeah, because without an economy, you, you have no middle class. Right, exactly. Well, they had an economy, but it wasn't an economy of, uh, <laughs> it wasn't a booming economy. <laughs> it was just, just, what they had there and what they could do. Yeah, comment. How successful was this government? I mean, it's good to analyze and say this is the mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. actually worked. I mean, it okay, something? it lasted and it operated well for 300 years. How old is the United States? <laughs> Ours isn't quite 300 years old yet. And so we haven't lasted for 300 years yet. And, and so uh, uh, this one lasted for 300 years. And it worked for 300 years. Yeah, comment. Does Bio, is that his name? Uh -huh. does, does he consider Greece or the Greeks to be a democracy? Because you said Iceland, he thought of as the first in Europe. Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, he doesn't even bring up the issue of Greece. And one reason is because um, I'm the one who's making this real emphasis on the Indo-Europeans and the similarities between the Indo-European cultures. Uh, I agree with you that Greece has a democracy, uh, but it's not, but it's only sort of a democracy. But maybe more so even the size. Maybe more so than the Iceland uh, uh, democracy, maybe the Greek democracy, but the Roman de the Roman Republic is sort of similar to this, isn't it? And which is a representative government, which makes you think of the House of Lords again with the Roman Senate, uh, the, the the elders. Only here they're not elders; here they're strong men, local strong men, but they're not that much stronger than their retainers. Um, in early Roman society, even like uh, Cincinnatus, who was uh -huh. only when he needed to be, and then he gave it up. Okay, it makes you think of Cincinnatus in the really early Roman Republic, that, that, that this would be a kind of similar. Six months. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting comparison, really interesting comparison that we might do. Well, uh, it's about time to take a break, which is fine. We're at a good point. Um, we might mention the three ages that, that uh, uh, actually Gwyn Jones has divided Icelandic history into. 930 to 1030 is the Saga Age. 1030 to 1200 is the Age of Learning. And the 13th century is the Sturlung Age, where you have the writing and the rewriting of history by Snorri Sturluson. Um, in the meantime, we have the coming of Christianity. Jesse Bach actually divides it into three different stages. And um, I'll tell you those stages when we come back from our break. And then we'll look at how Christianity comes to Iceland it doesn't change it very much at all. Um, but let's go ahead and take maybe a 10 or maybe a 15 minute break tonight and then, and then we'll continue with the culture of Iceland. Good discussion, people. <laughs>